uh, we're beginning to look, and we will finish looking at Psalm 3. So if you would turn with me there in your Bible, Psalm 3 is what we will study together this evening. Psalm 3 reads as follows. A psalm of David when he fled from Absalom his son. O Lord, how many are my foes! Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried, cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. Salah. I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on all your people. Salah. So far, the reading from God's Word this evening. May He add its blessing to our hearts. Well, I... I don't know how many of you have either done this or have been on the receiving end of this, but have you ever been walking along, on, maybe at the mall or at the grocery store, and you notice somebody is waving at you furiously. They're waving with much confidence. And then uh, halfway through the wave, they realize, uh-oh, I don't know this person. And they their, their face turns a shade of, of red, and it, it heats the whole store for a little while. This is the result of what? These people are so confident that they know who this person is that they act on it. They begin to wave. They, they greet them. My wife has told me I'm not allowed to do that anymore until I'm very sure. This is what happens when we are confident of something that is true. We act on it. And so, when we do these waves to people we don't really know, it's a, it's a misplaced trust, a misplaced confidence. But when we come to Psalm 3, it is the opposite. It is a confidence that is built on something that is so unshakably sure that you can act on it every time. David's confidence is complete, and it's placed in one person, in one God, that is the Lord of heaven and earth. So, as we work our way through Psalm 3, I want us to see... Uh, three things that David sets before us. It's really a prayer that he offers to God, and the first thing that he makes obvious in his prayer to God is his, duf his difficulties in the first two verses. Uh, he acknowledges his difficulties. Then in verses 3 through 6, we're going to see how he addresses the deliverance that God provides for him. In verses 7 through 8, he finds his assurance, again, in the finality of who his deliverer is. So we're going to look at acknowledging difficulties in verses 1 and 2. We're going to look at addressing deliverance in verses 3 through 6. And then we're going to hear about the assuring deliverer in verses 7 and 8. So those are the three things that we want to look at together tonight. I first want to point out in this psalm uh, the superscript that you've, you find written there in the English Bibles. It's not part of the versification. Uh, that indicates nothing really. Uh, but here in the beginning of the psalm, in the superscript, as we call those capitalized letters at the top of the psalm, uh, you find the historical context that David writes this psalm in. It frames the prayer that David is praying in Psalm 3. You notice uh, this very prayerful nature of this psalm. Immediately, he addresses God. He addresses uh, the Lord. David is addressing this uh, covenant God. The Lord, as it's written in all capitals, is God's covenant-keeping name, it's uh, His name where, that He uses when He is interacting with His people, showing them His faithfulness, showing them how He loves them, showing them how He cares for them even in times when they are unworthy of it. But David addresses the Lord by that name because he is in great distress. The superscript tells us what that distress is. He is fleeing from Absalom, his son. David, mighty King David, is fleeing for his life. You remember the story of Absalom and David, the nation at some point in David's reign turns from King David, 
seeks instead to follow Absalom, his son. You find that narrative in 2 Samuel chapter 15. It doesn't only develop out of a kind of a, a bad day that Absalom has. Maybe he's had an argument with his dad. But this was a conflict that had many years in developing. It started really with uh, David's oldest, Amnon, violating Tamar, Absalom's sister. Uh, David, of course, in that moment doesn't act. He, he simply is upset with, with uh, uh, Amnon. But Absalom does act. He lures his brother to a feast and he kills him, uh, murders him in cold blood, takes on himself the task of executioner. When he finishes that act, he flees to his grandfather, who is a king in Gesher. He remains there for a number of years, and after a time, he returns. He has the support of Joab, the commander of the army, and he asks his father, the king, to take him back. And once he returns, he goes on a campaign where he uh, purposely seeks to win over the hearts of the people of Israel so that he would be able to usurp the throne of his father, David. Now, Absalom is extraordinarily uh, successful in his campaign. He's not uh, some upstart, but he has uh, the support of uh, the people of Israel. He has the support of David's wisest counselors. He has the support of David's military. And uh, David assesses the cir circumstances, and he recognizes that in this moment, Absalom has won. He must flee for his life flee from Jerusalem and abandon the palace to have his son take it over. It's in this circumstance that Psalm 3 is written. Psalm 3 is written in the middle of David's despair while he's being chased by his own son who seeks his life. And so David cries out to God in the middle of this crisis. There's certain things that we can notice about David's cry. You see in verses 1 and 2, the word many is repeated three times. It's repeated not by accident. It's not like David lacks the vocabulary or a thesaurus so that he can choose a different word. But he is emphasizing there for us the significance of his predicament. It's not that he is a sensitive fellow and there are a couple of people in his court who don't like what he's doing. But there are many who have turned against him. There are many who, are, who have joined his son in chasing him away from Jerusalem. Many foes, many rising, many despising his very soul. And it's like it is so often in the history of the church. Uh, David is the minority. He is the remnant. And he is being chased by his enemies. And what David does in this psalm is he lays his anxiety, the disturbance of his soul, he lays it, lays it at the feet of the Lord. Absalom and his men are coming, and they say that there is no longer any deliverance for David's soul. That's what we read about in verse 2. It is, uh, from a short-term perspective, the temptation for David, I'm sure, to say, yeah, well, they're right. There is no deliverance for me. Look at me. I'm running for my life, having had to leave everything behind in Jerusalem. But there is more than just a short-term perspective of life. David is the one on the run with no hope of return, but he has a larger perspective, which he will draw on later. I do want us to see that word salah <clears throat> that is written in the margin of my Bible. I don't know where it's written in the Pew Bible, but uh, this is an obscure word. The exact meaning of this word is unknown. Uh, it is acknowledged by uh, most commentators that this is some kind of a musical uh, term. The exact meaning for this musical term is not exactly known, though. Some would say it means pause. Some means it's a change of uh, tone in the singing. Some would say it's an instrumental interlude in the singing of this psalm. Uh, the exact nature of that word is not no known. Now, why uh, would I draw our attention to a word that we don't know the meaning of? Well, it's because it shows us the public nature of the prayer that David is praying here. Now, Psalm 3 perhaps was privately uttered by David at some point or another, but it certainly has been intended and used in corporate settings ever since then. Uh, the direction for musicians in a prayer 
of David only indicates the public nature of this prayer. These are David's thoughts, but they are to be repeated by Israel in worship. In our context, they are to be repeated by the people of God in worship. So if we are to have a a corporate view of this psalm, it's important that we understand not only the problem that David sees, but also the solution that David sees. So I want us to look at, the, uh, at addressing the deliverance as it's written in verses 3 through 6. David has laid out his, his problem, his, his distress to the Lord, but then in verse 3, he also presents the solution to the problem that he has just presented. And he says three things of the Lord in, verses three, in verse 3. He says that the Lord is a shield, that He is His glory, and that He is the lifter of His head. Now, uh, when we speak of God as shield, David is not the first one to do that, of course. We know uh, in Genesis 15 when God, excuse me, when God is speaking to Abraham and giving him his promise, he begins speaking to Abraham by saying, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield, your reward shall be very great. This is the time when, when Abram cuts the animals in half and, and God passes through and, and makes his promise to Abram that he will be uh, the blessing of all the nations. And God then says to him, I am your shield. So let's think a little bit about what a shield does. Guys, do we know what a shield does? We don't, we don't use shields, of course, anymore in our days unless we're playing pretend of some kind or another. I guess shield, we could think of a shield as, as thick armor that we put on our, our armored vehicles in warfare. But in the olden days, a shield was used by soldiers very frequently. And they were used to much effect for what purpose? They were used to protect the soldiers from the swords, the spears, the arrows of the opposing army. And in uh, the military tactics of the ancient world, shields were used uh, with great effectiveness. Uh, the Romans, uh, perhaps some of you have seen pictures of it, uh, used something called the testudo, which simply means a turtle formation, where the men in the front row would, would put their shields together and their shields would be, be tall shields and the, and the men behind would put their shields overhead. And these men would lock their shields together uh, so that uh, when they advanced against the opposing armies and, and they would shoot arrows seeking to uh, kill the men as they crossed the ground to engage in the conflict, these shields would protect them. It's like David has that kind of a, a, a formation of shield in mind. Uh, God is the shield all about him. Uh, the missiles of the opposing army cannot hurt him. The Lord is his protector. The Lord is the one who keeps him safe. When David is weak, he is saying... When his very own son seeks his life, when he is being chased out of Jerusalem by a hostile army, uh, Yahweh, the Lord, he is a shield all about him. He is the thing that keeps David safe. He also says that, uh, that the Lord is his glory. You have to remember again where David is. He's fleeing from Jerusalem, a disgraced king. Does a king who is being chased out of his palace have any glory left? There's no glory left for David. He is humiliated. He is chased by his very own son. His glory is removed. But David doesn't lose sight of who the glory of Israel is, does he? He recognizes that the Lord is his glory. His position as king is not his glory. His glory is found in the Lord and in the Lord alone. And so he acknowledges it as part of his solution in verse 3. He says that he, the Lord, is the lifter of David's head. And the lifting of the head is an expression that was used by the Hebrews to, to describe the public removal of shame. And we can understand that picture even if we think about something perhaps that we have experienced in, in our own day. Maybe uh, you're in a public setting and you're being called on the carpet for something that you did wrong. If that, was to go, if that was going to be drawn in a cartoon, what would that cartoon character look like? He'd be standing there and, and his head would be down. He would be ashamed. But here comes the Lord. The Lord is the one 
who lifts his head up, the one who publicly will vindicate uh, David. David is confident of it. He is confident that if he is to be restored, it will come from the hand of the Lord himself. So David, uh, when he introduces the solution to his difficulties, quickly turns to the Lord and acknowledges him as his shield, his glory, and the lifter of his head. So he bases part of the solution in the things that he knows. But it's more than simply what he knows about. David seems to be placing his confidence in God in something that has happened in the past as well. It's in what he knows, but it's also in what he has experienced, what he has seen previously. And we see that in verse 4. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. Here we have David acknowledging something that has taken place in the past. His verbs are in the past tense. He cried to the Lord, and the Lord answered him from his holy hill. His confidence in the future rests on what he has experienced in the past. God is the deliverer. David knows it. David has seen it. Earlier, he has cried. Earlier, God has answered him from Zion. You remember from Psalm 2, Zion is the seat, the the picture of God's power in the nation of Jerusalem. It's occupied not by David. It's occupied by the Lord. The Lord is the one who has placed his king in Zion, his holy hill. And so David is not looking for a man to save him, but he is looking for God to save him. Now we say these things and when we read these psalms and we say David is trusting the Lord to save him. And it's, it sounds very simple. And it is very simple. But if it sounds easy, we're completely mistaken because we know those things to be difficult. We trust in the Lord because of our past and so often we forget about what God has taught us before. Uh, David, in verse 5 though, shows that he has full confidence in the things that he has experienced in the past. It shows him laying down and sleeping and waking again because the Lord has sustained him. So here we see uh, David having trusted and not being disappointed. David sleeps and he wakes. Why? Well, David knows why. He knows why because the Lord has sustained him. The Lord is the one who has held him up. And when you think through David's history as a As a person, you see those instances very clearly where the Lord has sustained him. When David was a young man and he fought against the lion and the bear, who was the one who upheld him? The Lord was the one who upheld him. And when as a young man he went out and he he fought against the nine-foot-tall Goliath, did he run out under his own power? What did he cry out to Goliath even as he was approaching him? The Lord will give you into my hand. The Lord is the one who kept him safe, even as he fought this experienced giant. When his father-in-law, Saul, was chasing him around in the wilderness, who upheld David? The Lord upheld David. The Lord is the one who thwarted Saul's plans. The, The Lord is the one who told David when Saul was coming to get him, when he was holed up, uh, holed up in cities. The Lord was the one in whom David's confidence rested. And so it's, it's not any different now. Uh, he trusts the Lord now also when Absalom comes. It has been uh, the characteristic of David's life, this faith, this confidence in the God to be the one who saves him. As part of this narrative, as, as David is being chased out of Jerusalem, you remember the account of, of Shimei the Benjamite. Right? And he's standing up on the opposite hill that David is, is walking. And he's, he's showering the king with dirt and rocks. And he's throwing all this stuff at the king and, and, and blaspheming him, saying, it's, it's your just desserts, basically. And you remember uh, Joab's brother, Abishai. Abishai, I think is his name. He, he says to David, why should this dead dog curse the king? Let me go over there and chop his head off. And what does David say? It is not my place. Maybe the Lord would have this man curse me. David trusts in the Lord in the middle of him being chased out of Jerusalem. David says, perhaps God will work it for good. 
And David can say that because he understands God is the one who sustains me in my time of trouble. Uh, David's confidence uh, flows from his knowledge. It flows from what he has experienced. And when he puts those two things together, he says in verse 6, there is nothing on this earth that will make me afraid. I will not even be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. I trust in the Lord. It's like uh, Psalm 2 again. The kings and the rulers, they're they're struggling against the Lord and against His anointed one. But does the writer of uh, Psalm 2 fear that? No, because he knows that these people are struggling against God in vain. In fact, Psalm 2 says that God laughs at people. That God laughs at the people who are working against the Lord and against His anointed. The Lord holds them in derision. David expresses his confidence in the Lord a little bit differently in Psalm 56. Verses 10 and 11, he says there, In God, whose word, I tr- whose word I praise, in the Lord, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? It flows from the promise of God to Joshua, to Israel, when he brings them into the promised land. And he says to them, Nobody will be able to stand against you. David has remembered that promise. David has experienced that promise. And David has full confidence in that promise as well. It's not only a a promise that should give confidence to people in in the kingdom of Israel. There is a New Testament uh, promise or confidence that comes along uh, with God's deliverance as well. You see it in in Hebrews chapter 13. In verse 5 and 6 it says, Keep your life free from love of money. And be content with what you have, for, uh, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's the very same promise that God made to Joshua and to Israel as they were about to enter into the promised land. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And the writer of the book of Hebrews turns to the New Testament church and he says in verse 6, So we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? That promise that God has made to David is just as sure as the promise that he has made to you and to me. And so we come to our circumstances with confidence because we know that our deliverance comes from the heavenly places. But then at the end of his prayer in verses 7 and 8, he speaks to his assuring deliverer one more time. Despite all that David knows, Despite all that David has experienced, he still asks God for his help. He makes his prayers of supplication to the Lord. It's part of the Lord's prayer. The Lord commands us to make supplications. He tells us that we are to ask him each day for our daily bread. And so David is asking the Lord, in in a sense, to uh, keep him, to give him his daily bread, in a sense. Uh, David, his salvation, he knows, is found in God alone which of course has an application for us in our days as well. Even though the enemy has changed, we're not worried about Absalom chasing us out of Jerusalem, there is another enemy, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And it can dislodge us from uh, the, the stronghold, which is Christ. And so we also are to pray to the Lord, asking Him to arise, to save us, to strike our enemies on the cheek, to break the teeth of the wicked. David trusts God to to defeat his enemies by crushing him. It brings us back, in essence, to uh, that promise that God has made in in Genesis, in the garden, where he says, uh, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. It's not, in our time, a physical crushing of the enemies of God, but that the spirit of the age would be cast aside and that the church would be preserved in her place. There is complete victory in the heavenly spiritual warfare. It is promised to us, and we should have confidence in it. In Revelation chapter 20, it describes uh, the final battle and the defeat of Satan. And Satan, of course, is released from prison. He comes out to deceive the nations, 
And in verse 9, he gathers all the people who are, uh, are loyal to him. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they march up over the broad plain of the earth and surround the camp of the saints and the beloved city. Desperate times. But the verse finishes. As they surround the saints and the beloved city, fire comes down from heaven and consumes them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. This is the hope of the believer. This is when we are in circumstances beyond our explanation. When we are in circumstances that even tempt us to forget about God's faithfulness. These are the promises that are in God's word. These are the promises that continually set us back, gazing for deliverance to the Lord and to His power and to His might. And so we see at the end of this psalm in verse 8, David never questions where salvation comes from. When he looks at Absalom, he doesn't say, oh, I wonder whose who's, uh, alliance I could call on so that Absalom would be thrown back into, uh, into his rightful place. But he says salvation belongs to the Lord and salvation belongs to the Lord alone. He knows that God is his deliverer. He trusts in it completely. Salvation belongs to God. It is an important thing that David says for us to consider. That we ought not to trust in man. There are uh, some places where that is done, of course. In the Roman Catholic Church, they speak of works of supererogation. Good works beyond what man needs for himself that can be given to others. Luke chapter 17 tells us that if we do all that God asks of us as his people... We're simply being faithful servants. We are simply doing that which God has commanded to us. Man can never save himself. Man can never uh, save another human being, especially if he cannot save himself. So man finds himself in a, a condition of guilt. But David looks to the right place. He says, my salvation can be found in God alone. And he asks for God's blessing to be upon his people. The blessings of God are salvation and, and deliverance. And David's request is, may those things rest on your people. May those things rest on me. Now, by way of application, I want to think of five different ways that this psalm uh, addresses us specifically. So, first of all, I think this psalm encourages us to address the eternal in our lives. That we are to not be satisfied with a good life here uh, and to not consider the good life here as paramount, especially when we are in danger of losing our soul. Mark chapter 8 and verse 35 and 36 says, For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? That's David's concern, isn't it? He's not primarily concerned with the return of his kingdom. He seeks his salvation, his deliverance from the Lord and for the Lord alone. And so there are two applications of this one application in essence. If you are pre-salvation, if you have not yielded uh, to the Lord, if you have not bowed your knee before him, if you have not acknowledged him as the only way that you will be reconciled to God, there's only one thing for you to do to address the eternal. That is to cry out, for forgiveness. It is to acknowledge your sin, your shortcomings, and to seek mercy from God and from God alone. There's also something for those who are already reconciled to God through the work of Christ. And that is a call for us not to be content with baby Christianity, if I can call it that. To strive for maturity through the study of the Word, to grow in our knowledge of God's promises. So first, we learn to address the eternal in our lives. The second thing that we learn, I think, is to trust Christ alone for salvation, for deliverance. We are primarily here as Reformed Christians, I think, and so we are quick to understand justification by faith alone, and we affirm it in our hearts and we acknowledge it. But there are other ways that we can not trust in Christ alone for salvation. 
our temptation would be more in the area of, of pride in our works and thinking that our works make God love us just a little bit more. We had uh, a couple of Wednesday nights ago, we went through the, the painful exercise of, of putting on the board all the different things that would cause us to think that we are more acceptable in God's sight. Perhaps it was the fact that we attend both worship services or, or the amount of our tithe or, or where we send our children to school or, or how we structure our worship service. Now, those things are all important, don't get me wrong. But none of these things cause God to deliver us. They flow from the fact that God has delivered us. So trust in Christ alone for deliverance. It's what David does. David doesn't trust in his, uh, his anointed position as king. He trusts in the Lord alone for his deliverance. I think in the third place it teaches us contentment. Contentment, of course, flows from a confidence that God is over all things, that we need not worry in any circumstance. A contentment will come when we with David in Psalm 56 will be able to say, in God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? That is uh, the finality or that is the summary of Christian contentment. It is what Paul and Silas must have believed for them to be able to sing those hymns in prison right after they had been beaten with rods. This is the lesson that David teaches us here in this psalm also. In the fourth place, we can learn constancy in prayer from this psalm. Though confident, we still pray. David knows of God's faithfulness, and yet he still offers his supplication to the Lord. Prayer, of course, is a, a rehearsal of our beliefs, more or for us, not for God. In prayer, we are acknowledging our dependence on God. When we offer up our prayer to God, God does not uh, wake up and say, I'd forgotten about Jeff. I didn't know that he was in trouble. When we pray to God, we are offering up uh, what God has instructed us to for our own reassurance. And we can be constant in this prayer. We are constantly acknowledging our dependence on God in prayer. Now, is there a day when you say to yourself, I don't need to be reminded of my dependence on God? If there is, I would encourage you to consider the second application that we talked about. Trust in Christ alone for your salvation. We come to God constant in prayer because we are constantly in need of His rescue. And then in the fifth place, I think we can learn that we should rehearse His faithfulness. Certainly from His Word, we rehearse the promises that God has given to us in Scripture, that He will never leave us or forsake us, that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. All those glorious promises from the prophets and, and from the epistles that are part of, of God's Word, we should be rehearsing them together. But how often do you talk about how God has watched over you with your friends and your children? How often do you talk of God's provision in your life, even here in this world? How often do you talk about how He has cared for you, how He has given you health? How often do you praise Him for uh, that tight spot that you were in when you cried out to Him for mercy and, and He granted you your request? Rehearse His faithfulness. Talk about it with your friends. Talk about it with your children. Talk about all the ways that God has protected you, certainly in the eternal. Certainly rehearse His promise uh, of salvation, but also talk about how He has protected you in this day. In Psalm 3, David's situation is very dire. But what do you, what do you notice about his tone in this psalm? He's very calm. He is completely dependent on the Lord. His son, this is unimaginable to us, his son is leading an army against him. But David looks at the Lord, who is his shield. Now, salvation belongs to the Lord in, in physical battle. David knew it, but he also leaned on him in the spiritual realm. We are to trust in the Lord. We would look around, uh, not fear man. These other circumstances that we face are less troubling when we know that the Lord is a shield about us 
that he is our glory, that he is the lifter of our heads. Let's pray together.